Good morning. A very, very warm, warm welcome to you at Liebsing from Liebsing James United Church, where we take our climate change obligations very, very seriously. Uh, right now, there's a technician downstairs looking at the boiler, so we're hoping to get some heat back on soon. Oh. Welcome to worship at Glebe St. James United Church in the Glebe neighborhood of downtown Ottawa on February the 25th, 2024. If you are here visiting or a newcomer, we extend a special welcome to you. If you're comfortable, uncomfortable, let someone near you know and they will assist you. There are green cards near the entrances and if you're interested in more, if you're interested in more information about Glebe St. James, fill one out and put it in the collection plate at the offering time. My name is Jim Lauder, and I'm a member of the choir and a member of the church council. Glebe St. James is an affirming, affirming community of faith in the United Church of Canada. Everyone and their gender, race, ethnicity, abilities, and sexual orientation is welcome and celebrated here in our worship. If you don't experience being welcomed, please let us know, and we'll try to do better. We mean it. I will focus on four announcements this morning. Uh, men and Friends, uh, Wednesday, that's this week, February the 28th, potluck at 5.30 for 6 p.m. So we're going to be eating at 6, but come at 5.30. We have a great, we have a great discussion last, last time we met, and we focused on the January-February uh, Broadway article, Seniors Moment. Broadway is the United Church's uh, publication. It comes out every month. Oldest publication in Canada, uh, by the way. At our February meeting on Wednesday, the, the 28th, we will continue with the topic of the Broadway article on Seniors Moment and discuss how men and friends can take this topic from talking to start doing. Pi Day, on, that's the second announcement, March the 10th, we will be having a special event at Coffee Hour. We are sending out invitations to all of the LGBTQ2S organizations in Ottawa to join us for pie. Any pie you can imagine might be there. Lemon pie. Pecan pie, tortiere, you name it, dessert pies, savory pies, pizza pie. If we pie, if it's a pie, we want it there. We will need volunteers to bring in pies, as well as a couple more people than usual to help set up and clean up coffee hour. If you're interested, please let Dylan or Jennifer know and invite all your friends in the community. Let's make this a pie-tastic <laughs> event for all regular and new faces at church <laughs> this that week. March 17th. It will be the annual congregational meeting. Lunch will be held before the annual congregational meeting to make sure everyone can be fully present and well-fed before the meeting. We are organizing a lunch. We are hoping to have Irish stew and bread and some side dishes, perhaps, to celebrate St. Patrick's Day. We will need a handful of people able to cook and bring in stew, as well as bring in bread, drinks, help with setup and cleanup. Please let, again, Dylan or Jennifer know if you can assist with anything. The last announcement, Lenten study, which is starting on Tuesday, it started this, it's already started on February the 20th, and continues this Tuesday at 7 p.m. The Lenten series is entitled, The Bible You Never Knew, Is the Spirit Still Speaking to the Churches? It'll be on Tuesday evenings during Lent and Easter. To arrange for a copy of the material and the Zoom link, please contact Jennifer in the office. There are lots more announcements, and if you haven't, they scroll on the screen. If you haven't had a chance to read them yet, they can be found on the church website and scrolling on the sanctuary screens at the end of the worship service. Today's worship bulletin can be found on the Glebe St. James website. On the website, you can also find a link to this week's announcements and the donate button to make your offering. If you are here in person, you can share your offering in the service. And now we're going to hear from Teresa before we hear the land acknowledgement. Thank you. Okay, um, not Modern Niagara is here. Um, apparently there's a leak in the boiler, um, but he knows the priority is heat now, uh, so they're working on it, okay? Hopefully we'll have some heat shortly. You may notice we're trying to have different people offer the land acknowledgement from now on. And this is so that a wide variety of us can have that experience and each person might offer their unique approach. So stay tuned for that. If you're interested, please speak to me or Wendy Bergeron 
and we'd be happy to have you offer a land acknowledgement and we can give you some general guidance as well. We're grateful to be gathered on the unceded Algonquin Anishinaabe territory. The Algonquin people have cared for the trees, the animals and the fish, the water and the air for many generations. Last week, after, last week, after church, some of us talked about the oppression faced by the Wet'suwet'en people in British Columbia due to pipeline development and climate injustice. We discussed how Indigenous people experience a disproportionate amount of climate change impacts. For the Wet'suwet'en, this is due to their close relationships with the land, their awareness of how climate change can increase forest fires, and also how the warm weather can increase the water temperature beyond levels that salmon can tolerate. How can the Wet'suwet'en people help their people heal if the land upon which they depend is not healthy? Would you join me in our call to worship? God welcomes the God welcomes the dreamers and the doubters. The hungry and the hopeful. God welcomes the young and the old. The faithful and the tired. Wherever you are on your journey, wherever your boat is at sea, this is God's house.
we thought we'd get you moving a little. Let's pray. God of the Lenten journey, we praise you. We set our intention to follow the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus through this sacred and holy season. You gave us Jesus to teach us about true worship and surrender. You call us out uh, to humble our hearts and open our spirits during this cruciform journey. You challenge us to repent and to prepare to be spiritually reborn. You call us to renew our commitment to our covenantal relationship with you, a relationship rooted in the teachings and the way of Jesus. So all praise and honor and glory are yours, O oh God, for the blessing of your transformative love. Amen. In our scripture passage, in our scripture passage today, Peter is out on a boat with the disciples when a storm hits. And instead of cowering in fear, Peter spots Jesus on the water. And in an amazing turn of events, he bravely gets out of the boat to be closer to Christ. Now, friends, I think the prayer for healing we do is one way that we do the same thing. We crawl out of our boats. And here's what I mean. In this prayer, we're honest about the storms that rage within us and around us. In this prayer for healing, we speak honestly in an effort to move closer to God. So this is our moment to crawl out of the boat. So friends, let's be like Peter. Join me in being courageous. Join me in truth telling. Join me in prayer. Because friends, it's time to get our feet wet. Let's pray. Gracious God, there are days that threaten to swallow us, days when the storms of life feel too big. In those moments, we often cling to the sides of our ships in fear, spending more energy hiding from storms than looking for you. Forgive us for doubting ourselves. Forgive us for doubting you. Rescue us from the storms of today and from the fears that trap us. With hope in our heart we pray, amen. Family of faith, you could get out of the boat and walk on the water like Peter or fall on your knees and stay in one place. No matter what you do, Christ's love for you is unchanging. So fearful or brave, faithful or doubting, Christ is always walking toward you. So hear and believe this good news, because God's love is stronger than any storm. On our best days and on our worst days, we're seen, forgiven, and loved. So hold that in your heart. God is always walking toward you. Thanks be to God. Amen. One of the gifts we have is the gift of peace. And today that's a good gift because we're going to get up and move around a little bit. And it's in the spirit of staying warm and staying centered in the peace that Christ brings that I say to you, peace be with you. Let's exchange a sign of peace.
second day of Lent. It's nice that you've all stayed. I haven't seen anybody leave because of the cold, so that's good. Uh, if you remember, oh, some people are even getting their coffee early. <laughs> if you need some, there's some in the kitchen, I think. <laughs> um, you may remember last year when we celebrated Lent, we had a special service as part of Black History Month and as a way of remembering people of African descent. The people of St. Mark's Church came and worshiped with us. And we just got a message just a day ago that um, they are inviting us to come worship with them next week <laughs> at 11 o'clock. So if any of you feel like joining them next week, it's at, um, it's at their church on Cumberland. And the announcement will be in the e-update this week. So you can plan to attend. As you know from last, week, last year, we had lots of singing and dancing. And there was good food. They, they didn't mention anything about food. But I'm sure there would be some. So uh, if you feel called to that service next week, we'll understand. So last week, we were remembering some symbols of Lent. And I wondered, since we don't seem to have any children this morning, I wondered if some of you might help me with some symbols at the front here. Who would like to come help us remember why we brought rocks forward last week? Could someone come up and place some rocks around the front and help us remember what that was symbolic of? Mm -hmm. And as you're doing, doing it, do you remember what the rocks were symbolic of? We have another friend here who might help us. You might. <laughs> and what do you think the rocks would be symbolic of? Our individual uniqueness. No two rocks mm. are people. Individual uniqueness. That could be a good one. Would you like to help with the rocks? Or you can help us with the next one, too. You can help us with the next one, since you're already here. Yes, and we were also thinking that the rocks... <laughs> <laughs> the rocks were also symbolizing the wilderness. And during Lent, we're journeying through kind of a rough time. And it can be uncomfortable as we move closer to thinking about Jesus' death. So the rocks were also symbolic of that. Then we also were using some water to remind us of what else? <laughs> I'll put you on the spot again. <laughs> but I think you have a depth of knowledge and wisdom on this topic. What could water symbolize during Lent? During Lent, water symbolizes uh, growth and nurturing of ourselves and plants in the wilderness. Yes, getting through the wilderness and God's blessings. We often use water for baptism to provide God's blessings to people. And Peter, as Teresa was mentioning, Peter was walking on water to reach Jesus. Yes, so why don't you go ahead and pour some water into our bowl. Thank you. And this week, we'd like to add another symbol. So who would like to help us place the next symbol? Thank you. Yeah, so we can hold it up. Yeah. And what do you think? Why are, why are we thinking of the cross at this time? A cross to bear. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes. We are Jesus' cross to bear at some point. Yeah, and Jesus had to bear his own cross. He had to carry it to the to his place of crucifixion. And then he was nailed to a cross and that's how he died, suffering. So it helps us remember what we're journeying towards at Easter. So could you just place this anywhere in our small table? Thank you. Yes, even though Jesus was God's son and he came here and all he talked about was love and how to be kind and care for people. And yet some people thought he was trying to take over from the Romans and become the king of the Jews. And they didn't like being challenged. 
because they thought he would take away his power. So as we keep moving towards Lent, we can keep these symbols in our hearts and think about what that means, what Jesus was carrying and what he was trying to convey to us. So let us pray, and you can repeat after me. Beloved God, you are always there for us. Help us remember your love as we journey through Lent and prepare for Easter. Amen. Good morning. This morning's reading is from Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 to 33. And to provide some context, just after receiving the news that Herod had murdered his cousin John the Baptist, Jesus had withdrawn to be alone for a while to grieve. And yet the crowds followed him to this solitary place, desperate to hear his message. As it grew late, they were hungry, so Jesus fed the 5,000 by sharing five loaves and two fish. By this time, Jesus was exhausted. Here begins the reading. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side of the sea while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink and cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? When they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. This is wisdom for our ancestors in faith. Thanks be to God. Good morning. Just before we present our, our gift of music this morning, it was brought to my attention, um, and thank you, Robert, um, that the text comes by really fast. Um, so just to help you sort of know what we're singing, because you won't have words up on the screens for you, um, um, I thought 
good idea to just share what the, what the text is. This is actually a text by Charles Wesley um, from the early 1700s um, and set to a really, really interesting, very, very upbeat, very gospel-y type uh, piece. Um, so the juxtaposition of this old language with the new music. Um, and some of these words were actually altered by the, by the composer himself. Um, so I'm just going to read to you the text. And are we yet alive and see each other's face? Glory and thanks to Jesus give for God's almighty grace. What troubles have we seen? What conflicts past? Fightings without and fears within since we assembled last. Hallelujah, we are alive and see each other's face. Glory and thanks and praise for God's almighty grace. Yet out of all our God has brought us through by love, and still, does, and still God does this help afford and hides our life above. Hallelujah, we are alive and see each other's face. Glory and thanks and praise for God's almighty grace. And if you're wondering, why are we singing hallelujah in the middle of Lent? Um, as Teresa reminded me, every Sunday in Lent is a little bit Easter. We're getting closer to it. We know that it's coming. So we're, we're, we're okay to give a, a little hallelujah at this point.
If the apostles were singers, that's what they would have been singing at when they figured out what was going on and that Jesus was truly the Son of God. On our first Christmas Eve serving Christian Island United Church, we made a mad dash after the service and it was crazy fast to make the 9 p.m. final ferry crossing to the mainland so that we could go and celebrate Christmas with the parental units. Well, there was a family with a couple of small children on the boat, as well as Ruth and I, and it was a stormy winter night. The doors were sealed. Even the passenger ferry crew were inside, and the waves were washing right over the decks. The boat was bobbing from side to side like a cork. Everyone was very tense, holding white knuckled onto the seats in front of them. It's 125 feet to the channel bottom, and believe me when I say we were all very aware of it that night. Everyone was quiet, and then all of a sudden, a small trembling voice said, I told you I didn't want to go on the boat tonight. <laughs> and every adult on the boat nodded. It was a scary night. It was a demonstration for me of the power of weather and water. It's no surprise to me that when Jesus left Nazareth and chose his home for the three years of his ministry, he chose a fishing village on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. Now, to call it a sea is a bit grandiose. It's really more of a lake, maybe comparable to Lake Ontario. It's about 141 feet at its depth. Uh, and it's important to know that it was deeper than any ropes that had been let down to measure. You know, the process of sounding where rope with lead weights attached is dropped into the water to determine its depth. Because they couldn't reach the bottom, they believed that the depth of the Sea of Galilee was unfathomable. And that is to say, endlessly deep and that it opened into the underworld. It was so deep. And we read again and again in the Gospels about Jesus and his disciples taking a boat across the lake. Well, it was the fastest point to get, or fastest way to get from point A to point B. But I also suspect that Jesus just liked to be on the water. And for those of you who are living on the shores or have a chance to canoe or kayak or be out on the boat, you know what I'm talking about. Now, a common boat in Jesus' time was about 25 feet from stem to stern. And a boat of that size held about 13 people. Good thing there weren't any more apostles, eh? Simon had spent nearly his entire life on the shore of the Sea of Galilee and had literally logged thousands of miles in boats, fishing and simply sailing across the lake. But on the occasion of our story, Simon would have an experience unlike any he'd ever had before. Matthew, Mark, and John all tell the story of the, sea, of the storm at sea but there are some variations. And it's only Matthew's account that includes Peter walking on the water. The journey should have only taken the disciples a couple of hours, were it not for the storm that sprang up, likely blowing them south and east. The little boat was buffeted by the wind and the waves. I have a good sense of that from the ferry and it was moving them a long way from their destination, and it was happening at night. Now, remember, the disciples in that kind of boat 
only had four oars, since the sail was likely put down to protect the mast, so the disciples were rightly anxious as their little boat was caught in the storm. So what happens next? Jesus from the land somehow knew the disciples were struggling and he sensed they needed help. So what does he do? He walks on the water and completely freaks his disciples out. They assume he's a spirit or a ghost. Now remember that portal to the underworld, you know, the gateway to the realm of the dead. The disciples were already afraid in the storm and now they were terrified because it appeared to them that a spirit had escaped from the underworld and was gonna take them to the realm of the dead. So just then, Jesus speaks up to them and encourages them and says, don't be afraid. Right, don't be afraid. What's going on here? The writer means us to recognize in this story a metaphor for what's happening in our own lives. We experience tempestuous storms in our life and they can terrify us if we allow ourselves to face them alone. Some of us have been tossed about the waves for months and are holding on white knuckled. For others, the storm just blew in last week. But for most, it's a frightening experience. And during the storms in our lives, when the waves are crashing up against our boat, we fear we won't survive. But friends, Jesus still walks on the water to wherever we are. And he gets in the boat with us. He may not make the storm go away as he did for Peter and the disciples, the cancer may still be there. The spouse may still be gone. But Christ is riding it out with us. And somehow, not being alone makes the storm less terrifying. Then there's the strange bit with Peter who calls out, I imagine in a pretty shaky voice, uh, Lord, if it's you, order me to come to you on water. What? Uh, would that occur to you in the middle of a storm? What's he thinking? Now, please notice an important detail here. Peter didn't just call out to Jesus and step out of the boat. He waited for Jesus to bid him to step out of the boat and come to him. See, he didn't trust his own ability to walk on water. Smart move. But he trusted that if Jesus called him to do it, he could. So Peter steps out of the boat. But here's the thing. Most people couldn't swim in those days. So there's Peter stepping out of the boat, no life jacket, no nothing, just Jesus. And Jesus had to trust, or Peter had to trust Jesus just enough to say yes to Jesus' call for him to walk on a stormy sea. That's faith, friends, and a sense of God's call. And it leads us to walk out in faith even when we don't know in advance how everything will work out. So think about that. Peter steps out and actually walks on the water. But then in a very human move, he notices the storm around him and he gets freaked out all over again. He begins to sink, and immediately Jesus reached out and grabbed him. Now, I can imagine Jesus saying something like, Peter, why did you look away? I had you. You didn't need to worry. All you had to do is trust in me. As it is so often with Peter, just after we see him take two remarkable steps forward in faith, we see him take one step backwards. And this is the picture we'll see again and again of Simon. Faith and bold, yet easily confused, deterred, and oh so flawed. Maybe that's why we love him so much. Because he reminds us of ourselves. He reminds us that despite our flaws, we can still be followers of Jesus. We can still trust 
that Jesus will rescue, befriend, and use us. Matthew tells us that when they got in the boat, the wind, the wind settled down, and that those in the boat worshiped Jesus and said, you must be God's son. Yeah, that's what the anthem really felt like to me. Wow, you must be God's son. This astounding miracle revealed that there was something profound about the man standing in the boat with them. And in a sense, they experienced in that moment an encounter with God. What kind of man walks on water? What kind of man calms the storms? Who delivers the sailors from harm? You know, the, the Jewish fishermen who, um, who have, known, have known the answer to that question. You know, if you're out there and something bad happens and you survive, my friends, that's God. So when the disciples acknowledged in the darkness as they knelt before Jesus saying, you must be God's son. This is the first time in the gospels that the disciples declared Jesus to be God's son. The first time they declared this kind of faith in him. They'd known him as a carpenter from Nazareth. They knew him as a rabbi who called them to be fishers of people. They'd seen him perform some miracles and while they didn't understand the fullness of what it meant, they had nevertheless experienced God's presence in this man that night on the sea. Now there's another clue to the dis identity of Jesus. Um, when Jesus first spoke to the disciples as he came walking to them on the water, he said, be encouraged, don't be afraid. But he also said, it's me. In the original Greek, it translates as I am. In order to understand this, think about all the way back to Moses in front of the burning bush, when God tells him to go back to Egypt and deliver the children of Israel from slavery. And, God, and Moses, quite rightly, asked God, well, um, when they ask which God has sent me, what should I tell them? What's your name? And God's reply, do you remember, is I am who I am. So in today's story, Jesus speaks these same words, and when he does, he's giving us a clue to his identity. You know, I remember back to my first pastoral charge. Uh, one night in the early hours of the day, there was a terrible car accident, and uh, one young woman was killed and another seriously injured. And in the early hours of the next morning, I learned that one of those youth was connected to our church. It was devastating to the small community of 325 people. As I prepared the funeral message for Leanne, I was drawn to the scripture that we've been focusing on uh, today. And I shared with those present that I didn't believe God willed this accident. Because I don't think God causes accidents or takes children away from their parents. God does not typically circumvent the laws of physics to keep accidents from happening. So what does God do in the midst of the tragedies that occur in life? The storms that come our way. See, I think the story of Jesus and the storm was told and retold by the early church because it painted a picture of what Jesus does in our lives. He still comes to us in the darkness, in the storms of life, in the tragedy and the pain, and he still walks on water, steps into our boats, or sometimes dives into the water to be with us. He holds us and says to us, don't be afraid, it's me. And I firmly believe that in the middle of the night, on that dark stretch of rural road, 
I believe that God was there with Leanne and her friend. And I think he was whispering to them, I've got a hold of you. It's me. Don't be afraid. He didn't wish for the accident. He didn't plan it or cause it or will it. But when it did happen, he held Leanne near and said, you're mine. You're safe in my arms. Friends, we're called to remember that in the midst of life's worst storms, when we're scared and don't know how we're going to make it through, that Jesus still comes to us, walking on the water through the storm. He comes to us, steps into the boat with us, calming the wind and the waves. And there will be times when we're deeply afraid, just like that night when I was on the ferry. I really thought Christmas Eve was going to be the end of the story for us. But if we take away anything from Peter's story, it's that Christ will be with us. We can be afraid, but know that we won't always be in this place of terror. And second, when the worst happens, we're never alone. For Christ is there, arms wrapped round and holding us tight. As we say every benediction here in this church, God, the source of love, Jesus, the love incarnate, and the Holy Spirit, love's comfort and power, go with us always. Amen. My friends, your gifts, large and small, bring about possibilities that are blessed by God. So I would invite you at this time to please make your offering by contributing online or by placing your offering on the plates. The offering will now be collected.
Grace-filled ones, we uphold to you our offerings of time, talent, finance, and food. May they be agents of grace in a world of need, and may they inspire your work wherever it may be. Amen. If you remember, a couple of weeks ago, I talked about streets in Ottawa that we um, should maybe consider renaming. Well, I want to offer a candidate, one of many, many um, Canadians who's a black Canadian or a Canadian of African descent who has made a difference in Canadian culture. George Elliot Clark, was born in February, on February 12, 1960. He's not old, eh? He's a Canadian poet, a playwright, and a liturgy, a liter, blah, 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 blah. he's not a liturgy cat critic, he's a literary critic. <laughs> and he served as the Poet Laureate of Toronto from 2012 to 2015, and actually as the 2016-2017 Canadian Parliamentary Poet Laureate. And his work is known for a vast range of literary and artistic traditions, both high culture and low culture. And his work is known for its lush physicality and its bold political substance. He's one of Canada's most illustrious poets, and he's known for chronicling the experience and history of the black Canadian communities of Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. He created a cultural geography that he has named Afcadia. He grew up in Nova Scotia. He's uh, the seventh generation of his family in what is now known as Canada. Seventh generation. George did his university education at Waterloo and Dalhousie and Queens, and he ended up as a professor at the University of Toronto. He is a sought after speaker, and he's really active in poetry circles throughout Canada, the US, the Caribbean, and Europe. He's also, and I did not know this about him, I knew his poetry, but he's also the founding member of the music collective called Afro Metis Nation. Afro Metis Nation. Now that's not a common nation I had really thought about, but it's a group of Africadian and Mi'kmaq descent musicians. Now imagine a mixture of indigenous and African drums and add blues guitar, Highland bagpipes, yeah, and Acadian fiddles. In fact, some of his poetry has been set to music by the a cappella uh, gospel quartet for the moment. Well, a, while he was the Canadian parliamentary poet, he expanded significantly uh, the role, and he was the first poet laureate to have his poems recited in both the houses and recorded in Hansard which is the official record of the Canadian government. Here's a Canadian of African descent that we really could name a street after.
my friends. Who has prayers they'd like to share? Prayers of gratitude and thanksgiving. Thank you for heat. Yeah, because I wasn't sure. My hands have actually gone numb. <laughs> numb enough that I went to scroll on my iPad and it wouldn't take my. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there you go. Thank you. <laughs> Other prayers of gratitude. Thank you. For community. Absolutely. For people who share their gloves with you, yes. Oh, baby. <laughs> For placers of stones. For places of stones? Placers of stones. And pourers of water. And carriers of crosses. Because we all have people that walk those paths with us, don't they? For the opportunity to sing in the choir. The opportunity to sing in the choir. For a really beautiful prelude. prelude. Oh, yeah. For sure. Wow. Going to a lantern workshop and your friends. We will definitely say thank you. I'm grateful for you. Because you could have left when the boiler was off, and I would have understood completely. But you wore your coats and you stuck around, so thank you. Let us sing. Prayers of concern. For the family and friends of Alice and Etter. For family and friends and Alice and Etter. If you've been around this place for quite a while, you might remember Allison. Uh, she uh, did her musical training here at uh, U of Ottawa and sang in the choir and took part here for a while was eventually ordained out west, and she passed away this week um, from uh, complications um, of an illness that she's had since she was small. But the hard part is she leaves behind her husband and her son who had just turned to last Sunday. So we pray for the Etter family uh, and everyone who's been affected uh, by Allison's passing. For mother-in-law's uh, failing uh, and having declining health, that's tough. Yeah. We pray for Arnett and, and Flory. Um, Arnett is extremely ill uh, and um, will not survive um, much longer. So we pray for him, and we pray for Sue, who's providing pastoral care. For Donna Faye. For Donna Faye, who took a tumble. For Louise, who is now palliative. That's a hard but holy walk. Yeah. Yeah, we need way more peace in this world. We need peace in the Middle East. We need peace in Palestine and in Israel and in the Sudan and peace in Ukraine and probably other places that I'm not thinking of at the moment. There's a lot of suffering out there. And We don't know 
what the person sitting next to us in the pews carries. We don't know um, what's happening in their families, amongst their friends. So be gentle. And Holy One, we lift all of this up to you, this messiness of being human and finite. And we sing. And now we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, but a different version. Our parent who is among us, blessed be your creation. Thank you. In vain in liberty as on earth. May we be more interested in building your reign here and now than in building it to come from above. Let us share our birth for those who are hungry. Help us through the time of temptation, delivering us from all evil. For ours are the eternal blessings that you pour upon the earth. Amen.
beloved wanderers, as you leave this place, may you carry your curious heart on your sleeve. May you look for God in every face. May you find the courage to get out of the boat because we're going to run to the tomb and we're going to speak our faith. And when your world falls apart, as it sometimes does, may you hear God's voice deep within saying, take heart, it is I, be not afraid. For you are called, you are blessed in both your ups and your downs. You always belong to God. So go now in peace, trusting that good news. for coffee, warm up. <laughs>